And I will call on stage the representative for Katse Maroc. Katse Maroc. We. Akote. I call upon for Kenya, Stephen Kinyungu, Deputy Director of Climate Change in the Ministry of Environment and Forestry. Then I'll call upon uh, Crispin Oven from the NDC uh, Partnership Caribbean. Please join us. Then from Vanuatu, I'll call Chris, who'll stand in for Mike. Uh, and then we'll wait for Sarah from Mozambique. You're here? Okay, please. And then we'll also introduce uh, a representative from the Africa Group of Negotiators who will also join us from the floor. We'll, we'll join the second panel on the negotiation, uh, sorry, on the panel discussions. So welcome everyone. Uh, we are here because this is the first uh, regional NDC dialogue. And I'm Davina, I'm, I'm the coordinator of the Africa NDC Hub. You can see our panel there. And so for logistic reasons, we have uh, our, it's, uh, you can speak in French or English. And we also have, at the end of it, we'll also do an interactive audience slide or uh, input. So we'll ask you to input your comments on this event. And then let me say it is also live stream. So you can send out the log for your uh, colleagues to follow uh, off-site. So uh, let me just say that in setting up this event, it was quite a, a collaborative event across regions. We had uh, the team in Fiji from the Pacific Islands, and then we also had uh, the team from uh, the Caribbeans, ourselves, FAO, GGGI, Islamic Development Bank, and uh, and the team from the organization of the East, Afri East Caribbean States Commission. Uh, let me recognize Mara Emelian from FAO, Rebecca Slivia Ayan from the Pacific NDC Hub, John from the NDC Partnership, Anik and Prahab from GGGI, Ola Tunji from Islamic Development Bank, Crispin from the Caribbean NDC Hub, Rita and myself from the FDB. I'll tell you, if you've seen the flyer, that I can attest that that is a handmade crafted by those NDC hubs. So that was a collaborative effort. If you take it, it's on, it's on the display out there. Just know that was handmade. We put in a lot of passion to have it delivered. So uh, in short, the Africa NDC hub uh, is a response uh, to that we have 50 out of 54 African countries that have ratified their NDCs. The hub is a partnership of 15 members, institutions that do development. So uh, currently we have 15 members, but it's open uh, for membership. And, and the hub also works with the NDC partnership. That's why we have the team here. Uh, for the Pacific regions, all the 14 members of the Pacific Island states have ratified their indices and submitted them. And in particular, the Republic of Marshall Island has and was the first nation in the world to submit its enhanced NDC. So overall, the Pacific NDC hub uh, helps the uh, Pacific Island countries implement their NDC, driving sustainable and resilient development in a transition to a low carbon development pathway. It's supported by the GIZ, GGI, NDC Partnership Support Unit, and the Pacific Community. We'll hear more of that when the representative speaks. And then last but not least, the Caribbean NDC, all the members of the organization of East Af Eastern Caribbean states have ratified their indices. And then in uh, last year, they, they came together to set up what they call the Caribbean NDC Finance Initiative, which is the NDC hub. So the, the purpose of our gathering today is to share our teething experiences, our early wins, uh, in a common pursuit to make ourselves relevant to our clients. Because ultimately, 
these NDCs, NDC hubs wouldn't be anything if they are not serving the communities. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome my Vice President, Mr. Amadou Hort, the Vice President for Power, Energy, Climate Change, and Green Growth at the African Development Bank. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Davina. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, let me say uh, welcome to uh, this Talanor. This is something that I didn't know about before. I was told that uh, basically it's a way to uh, discuss, negotiate, um, put differences aside uh, with the view to learning from each other and finding solutions. But here I think it will be really an opportunity to share uh, views, uh, basically to learn from each other, uh, to see how we can fast track uh, the implementation of the NDCs, both in Africa, uh, in, in the Pacific Islands, but also in the Caribbean. While we uh, conceptualized the African NDC hub uh, two years ago, uh, with 16 uh, institutional partners, um, we were concerned about the risk of each country trying to implement uh, their NDCs without really a clear framework and a support, uh, both on the capacity building side, but also, and very importantly, on the resource mobilization side. Because we all know that for the case of Africa, 80% um, of the NDC's targets uh, depends on the support that Africa expects to have uh, from the global community. And I'm sure it is the same for the Pacific uh, and, the, and the Caribbean as well. As you know, millions of people in our regions are affected by climate change, by the rising sea levels, but also by drought. And we see in many countries the governments uh, using budgets that were basically planned for education, health, and other uh, development activities, but sh uh, shifting them to deal with uh, the consequences of climate change. And in the same time, uh, our regions are the least contributors to climate change. Uh, and in the same time also, our regions have been one of the first to ratify the NDCs. For example, in Africa, uh, 50 out of the 54 countries have already uh, ratified uh, their, their, their NDCs, basically. So we have a challenge. We are committed to the SDGs, committed to the Paris Agreement, but in the same time, we need to mobilize resources and technical capacity to help also uh, develop our, our economies. I would like to say that the $100 billion that were committed by the, developing, the developed countries should not be viewed as only aid. Uh, if you look at Africa, for example, uh, in the Congo Basin, uh, we have exceptional natural resources that allows to capture the carbon on the ground. It is estimated that in the Congo Basin, it's about 30 billion tons of carbon that is captured there. It has been captured for the last, uh, you know, hundreds of years. And uh, this has a value. If the financing and the financial mechanisms in the Paris Agreement, in particular the pricing of carbon and the exchange of carbon credits is implemented, 
Africa, in particular in the Congo Basin, billions of dollars can be mobilized to help those economies deal with the impact of, of, of climate change. We also know that thousands and exactly 1,900 businesses have signed to the principles for responsible investing. And those businesses alone have assets under management of more than $70 trillion. And in 2016 alone, more than $6 trillion have been divested uh, from, I would say, uh, uh, carbon emitting assets. And now these businesses are trying to find new investment opportunities to put that money uh, basically to use. And that provide us with an opportunity. But that opportunity, we will not be able to uh, uh, basically take advantage of it if we are not able to translate the NDCs into bankable projects. Bankable projects not only for governments to finance or for donors to finance, but more importantly, uh, for the private sector to finance. Uh, that requires basically training government officials, that requires uh, supporting financial institutions, that requires supporting SMEs in our economies. And this is exactly what the African Development Bank has been doing. And we've, for example, this year supported six countries, uh, including uh, Rwanda, Kenya, Seychelles, Namibia, Mozambique, and Uganda. We also trained the SMEs and uh, legislators, in particular the ECOWAS legislators, because also you need the right legislation. Uh, you need the legislators to approve those tax incentives that are required to promote, for example, renewable energy. Uh, in some countries, when you import solar panels, you don't pay VAT, but in many, you still pay VAT, and that makes solar panels more expensive. In the same time, the government have been subsidizing the national utility, which in most countries uh, uh, is using fossil fuel, for example. But for solar PV systems, we don't have always that support which is needed and which help, by the way, accelerate the access to energy. And for us, that is very important. That's why we spend time uh, with the legislators. In the, in the coming years, uh, the NDC hub, under the leadership of, of Anthony Young, the director for climate change and green growth, and his team, and Davina, and all the team, uh, we are expecting to boost the support to African countries so that uh, they can basically um, materialize the implementation of the NDCs. Uh, I look forward to a stronger and uh, uh, fruitful South-South engagement, to hearing more about what's been done in the Caribbean, but also in the Pacific Islands. And uh, we look forward to learning from each other and to hopefully taking away some of the key lessons to Africa, but also to the Pacific Islands and also to the Caribbean. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice President. And now we'll start our country perspectives, our regional perspectives. So let me introduce, we're going to start with uh, Fossi Morocco. Fossi Morocco, as you can see, is a member of the Africa NDC Hub. Morocco has been very proactive in uh, getting the continent active, they hosted the uh, COP22 and really got us off the ground. They made Africa proud by the proactiveness that they got on uh, the, the, the Paris Agreement. So I welcome you, sir, uh, representing Madame uh, Shafir, who's un unable to be here, to give us a uh, Fossi Maroc's perspective in terms of rolling out their NDC. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, all. Okay, I try to give uh, my presentation in, uh, in French because we have the traduction, uh, simultaneous uh, traduction. So I represent um, Madame Shafil here, director of uh, 4C Morocco. 
Bon, je m'appelle Mustafa Bendebi. Moi aussi, je travaille en étroite collaboration avec Madame Chafil, qui est la directrice du Centre de compétences changement climatique. Bon, ma présentation va être normalement focalisée en deux parties. D'abord, je vais vous donner un aperçu sur le 4C Maroc, sa constitution, sa mission, ou bien ses missions principales. Et après, je vais aborder la question qui est le, le sujet principal de, 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 cette, de cet événement. C'est comment euh, aider à la mise en œuvre des contributions déterminées au niveau national et comment partager les expériences des, 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 des pays, bien sûr, qui, sont, qui ont vraiment euh, réussi à, à la mise en œuvre de, de cette contribution pour échanger avec nos, nos pays voisins. Donc le, le centre de compétences changement climatique, bien sûr, c'est un centre euh, qui est constitué par euh, les différents acteurs concernés par la problématique changement climatique. Donc la constitution, c'est à travers quatre collèges. On a pensé à ce que les collèges principaux qui restent normalement à les regrouper et les, euh, les instituer sous forme d'un groupement d'intérêt public, c'est le secteur public. Bien sûr, les administrations, les départements ministériels, ça c'est le premier collège. Le deuxième collège, c'est le secteur privé, les entreprises et les, les secteurs semi-publics. La troisième collège, normalement le troisième collège qui est, on compte vraiment à, à l'avoir euh, institué dans le cadre de 4C Maroc, c'est la société civile parce que on veut faire valoir les efforts déployés par la société civile et mieux identifier leurs leur besoins en matière de lutte contre le changement climatique. Donc, elle est parmi le groupe Monde Intérêt Public de 4C Maroc. Et le quatrième collège, qui est normalement, c'est la source vraiment de l'identification des besoins de tous ces collèges, c'est le secteur, c'est le collège de la recherche et expertise et la formation donc, elle est parmi le groupement d'intérêt public. Les missions principales du de, 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 de centre de compétences changement climatique, la première mission, bien sûr, c'est contribuer au renforcement de capacités des acteurs nationaux et des acteurs locaux, territoriaux, et voire même les transférer vers les pays voisins, nos amis africains, bien sûr, pour échanger les expériences réussies en la matière. Le, 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 la deuxième mission de ce, de ce centre, c'est la gestion de la connaissance changement climatique, le savoir-faire et surtout le savoir-faire en matière de la vulnérabilité, l'atténuation et les moyens de mise en œuvre qui sont vraiment liés à la lutte contre les changements climatiques. Lorsqu'on dit les moyens de mise en œuvre, ce sont le financement, bien sûr le transfert de technologies et un programme consistant de renforcement de capacités. La troisième mission de ce, de ce, de ce collège, de ce, de ce centre, c'est comment développer des études d'aide à la prise de décision. C'est-à-dire, une fois avoir des études, des rapports qui sont là, donc comment développer vraiment des, 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 des études pour aider les décideurs politiques à mieux prendre une décision qui peut aller sur la longueur, ou bien sur la même longueur d'onde, que la communauté internationale nous, nous, nous demande. Et la quatrième mission, c'est une mission primordiale, c'est-à-dire tous les efforts qui sont déployés pour lutter contre les changements climatiques à travers notre pays et les, les pays voisins doivent faire valoir, on doit faire valoir parce que c'est un, un, un effort qui est déployé par les pays, mais il n'est pas recensé, il n'est pas connu, donc c'est ça qu'on veut de, à travers ce centre. Donc le centre de compétences changement climatique, comme vous le voyez, c'est un centre qui regroupe tous les composantes. Donc revenons au 4C Maroc. Donc euh, on a développé quatre, quatre programmes prioritaires. Donc, premièrement, comment appuyer le, 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 la partie marocaine ou bien les autres pays à la mise en œuvre de la Convention cadre des Nations Unies et l'accord de Pâques. Donc tout le monde c'est que la Convention nous, nous, nous demande de développer des rapports nationaux, mais ces rapports nationaux, quelles sont les informations vraiment qu'on compte les mettre Donc comment aider à mieux faire la reconnaissance des efforts dans les supports de communication que la communauté internationale nous demande à travers les communications nationales, les rapports biannuels actualisés et la fameuse maintenant 
contribution déterminée au niveau national. Donc la troisième, le deuxième programme, c'est comment appuyer la délégation, les délégations bien sûr, à mieux se prononcer au sein des enceintes de négociation. Donc soit à ce que on, pour mieux se positionner, comme vous le savez tous, c'est un processus très délicat et tout le monde le sait et on n'arrive même pas à mieux se positionner dans, dans ce processus. Sachant que vraiment les pays qui, qui souffrent de mieux, c'est la langue. La langue anglaise prime parce qu'on a beaucoup de choses à dire, mais faute de linguistique, faute de ne pas recevoir des textes au, au préalable pour mieux les examiner, pour mieux les identifier, quel sont notre positionnement, on trouve une difficulté de mieux communiquer à nos décideurs, quels sont, surtout l'anglais, il est très difficile. Un point virgule change la phrase. Charles, Schuld, comme vous le savez, donc, on doit vraiment mieux cerner ses besoins et mieux les combler dans les enceintes de négociation. Donc le 4C Maroc compte vraiment élaborer des guides de, de négociation et tient des, des, des réunions, bien des ateliers préparatoires en amont pour mieux aller avec une seule position, une position unifiée. C'est vrai qu'on a toujours la position unifiée au sein de notre groupe africain, bien sûr, mais on compte vraiment l'organiser pour mieux aller d'une manière solidaire et on, on, on prononcer avec nos partenaires ici qui sont vraiment mieux outillés dans la matière. Le troisième programme dans la, dans, dans la lutte de, contre les changements climatiques, c'est-à-dire comment impliquer les, terro, les, terri, les, les territoires, les villes, les localités dans la lutte, de contre, de, dans la lutte de, contre le changement climatique. Impliquer, c'est un mot facile à dire, mais comment c'est ce qu'il reste à faire C'est-à-dire tout un arrangement institutionnel qu'on doit penser. Tout, tout un, un cadre institutionnel qu'on doit le mettre en place et comment assurer le mieux opportune à travers les territoires et les villes et les collectivités locales. Le, le, quatrième, le quatrième programme, c'est la formation, l'information et la communication autour et on, tout, on assurant un veille, un veille climatique, c'est-à-dire à chaque fois lorsqu'on... On, on, un rapport est édité par la communauté internationale, surtout la communauté scientifique. Comme vous le savez, actuellement, on a reçu le rapport du GIEC spécialisé en termes de 1,5. Tout le monde a été interpellé par les décideurs politiques dans leur pays. C'est quoi le 1,5 Quel est l'impact du changement climatique si on peut arriver Et sur, sur, quoi, sur quelle trajectoire on peut aller Donc tout ça, il est préconisé, reconnu dans le, dans, dans le centre de compétences changement climatique pour mieux être vraiment informé et outillé auparavant, avant d'aller vers, vers, vers okay. de, de prendre une yeah. décision. Je peux aller trop vite. Donc, euh, sans trop tarder. Donc, il y a une stratégie, bien sûr, de renforcement de capacité par le 4C Maroc, c'est-à-dire on veut analyser les états du lieu, on veut faire recenser les besoins en matière de renforcement de capacité, évaluer les besoins pour la mise en œuvre des contributions déterminées au niveau national et mettre en place des outils de suivi et d'évaluation. Il m'a demandé d'aller trop vite, mais parce que maintenant, je suis arrivé à, à, au sujet d'aujourd'hui, c'est-à-dire la mise en œuvre de, 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 de l'indice et comment le Maroc a mené ce processus. Avant d'aller vers la mise en œuvre de l'indice, c'est très important, permettez-moi, c'est très important, on a lancé un processus, comment élaborer la feuille de route de mise en œuvre de, de, de l'indice et comment peut-on la transformer en plan d'investissement vert à travers les projets qui sont préconisés. Donc l'étude qu'on a, qu a lancée, c'est-à-dire on a élaboré 50 fiches de projet et après on, a, on va examiner les 50 pour identifier 10 fiches de projet à se mettre au bailleur de fonds. On a appuyé les deux bassins de, 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 de commission de, 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 de l'Afrique, c'est-à-dire la commission du bassin de Congo à travers l'étude de préfiguration pour la mise en place du fonds bleu et la deuxième mission du Sahel, comment rendre service à la commission du Sahel à travers l'élaboration d'un plan d'investissement climat. Donc, je n'ai pas, pas, pas trop à dire, mais pour finir, euh, je voudrais bien dire que le 4C Maroc a donné vraiment un, une série de formations sur la finance climat, une étude de faisabilité 
a été réalisé pour mettre au niveau national, c'est-à-dire au Maroc, un fonds climat national, un fonds climat national qui peut rendre service ou bien pour financer les projets d'atténuation et d'adaptation. Et on a mis en ligne une formation sur la finance climat au profit des acteurs bancaires marocains. Si, si vous me permettez, la dernière, la, le dernier point, c'est le renforcement de capacité des acteurs privés ou bien du secteur privé. On ne on veut, on veut pas laisser vraiment le secteur privé à côté de la trajectoire de, des politiciens. Donc le secteur privé est les deux dans les acteurs non étatiques, le, 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 leur intervention, leur contribution doit être recensée et reconnue. Donc à travers le 4C, on a organisé des journées pour, 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 la, pour les, les entreprises et le changement climatique des secteurs privés. On a organisé vraiment des ateliers de renforcement de capacité pour la qualification des projets pour les activités vertes et un système de management des risques environnementaux et climatiques, l'accès de petites et moyennes entreprises à la finance verte. Et dans le cadre de la, de, de la coopération Sud-Sud, on a élaboré ou bien on compte élaborer un guide sur la finance climat et un atelier sur le, un atelier bien sûr dédié aux pays africains sur l'accès à la finance climat est prévu en 2019. Vous ne m'avez pas donné beaucoup de temps parce que je me suis précipité par le temps, mais je sais on sera toujours à votre disposition. L'adresse mail, elle est normalement, on va le communiquer. Euh, je vous souhaite vraiment un, un bon réussite dans cet événement. Et merci. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that elaborate presentation. Fossi Maroc, Fossi Maroc's work is really appreciated and well known. Let's turn to Mozambique. Give us your experience on your rollout of your NDC partnership. My VP just mentioned that we were with you at the country engagement. So please give us your feel on uh, how things are going in Mozambique. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Fox, I apologize for my English. My language in Mozambique is Portuguese, so sorry. Um, in Mozambique, 80% of the population depends on small, small all the substance agriculture for their livelihoods. The majority of this agriculture is rain-fed and high vulnerab vulnerability to climate change. Climate change projection predict increased temperature, great rainfall, variability, and shortly growing season due to shifts in the start of the rain season, where the rain season and dry, dry season. This will directly impact crop yield, farm and live food, and food security in Mozambique. Considering this, the focus for Mozambique is therefore on build resilience and facilitating adaptation to the impacts of climate change. And at same, same time, we are conscious of the role of the agriculture sector in contributing to climate change. Uh, we are involved to, in NDC uh, and the agriculture sector include the fishery, life, wood, and forest Promoting a private sector of Mozambique in this commitment has manifested in this NDC and the recent dev development 2020-2025 NDC roadmap. Mozambique formalized its request for technical assistance under the NDC partnership in August 2008. The government of Mozambique appointed two government institutions as focal point for the NDC partnership. I talk about the Minister of Land, Environment, and Rural De Development. Uh, and this minister is taking the lead in close collaboration with the Minister of the Econ Economy and Finance and involve other national ministers, including the Minister of Agriculture, as well as other institutions and develop, development partnership. On 15 November 2008, the government of Mozambique launched free here NDC partnership plan 
2008-2021 has a mean to deliver on its commitments under the Paris Agreement. The partnership plan aligns short and medium term needs for climate change adaptation and mitigation at the national level with resources and support provided by eight NDC partnership members, including German, uh, UNDP, and FAO, operating in the country throughout the day existing and planned projects. I am very happy to say that uh, FAO is providing support to put in place an encounter facilitator who oversees the de development and implementation of NDC partnership plan in Mozambique. Uh, now I'll talk about the way forward. The work has only just now started. We are looking forward to collaborate with ministers in Mozambique and work close with partnership at national level and international organization, including the FAO, in responding to the identified country needs and priorities as expressed in our NDC and NDC partnership plan. As started by the, the vice minister of uh, Mitadere, is the environment minister, during the launch of the NDC partnership plan in Mozambique in November. We believe that these instruments create the condition for Mozambique to fully implement its national determinate contribution, while responding to national priorities for resilience, sustained and low emission development, and the international commitments under the Paris Agreement and Sustainable Deve Development Agenda. The col collaboration with FAO and others in responding to the urgent need in Mozambique will allow us to increase the re resilience of agriculture, livestock, and fisheries to support improved food security, nutrition, and the sustainable development of Mozambique. At the same time, where possible, we will ensure that GAG emissions from agricultural activity are min minimized. The NDC partnership plan will require additional support to be mo mobilized for planning condition, monitoring, and implementation for, of activities on the ground. We are working with PNUD uh, on develop developing a proposal to support the national adaptation planning process in the country. FAO is providing support also directed to the Minister of Agriculture to building the capacity of a climate change unit with, with the ministry, which will support us co coordinating, overseeing, and implementing climate change related activities. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving us uh, Mozambique's uh, state of play. Now let's turn to Kenya. Kenya has a presentation, if we can just load it, and they'll give us uh, what is happening in Kenya, then we'll go to the regions. Thank you, thank you very much. and. Uh, my gratitude, of course, to the organizers for the invitation. I will do a quick presentation on Kenya's uh, climate change policy landscape, of course, and share lessons. Uh, so, the, I start, of course, I, I don't want to start at the very basic level of uh, highlighting the reality of climate change uh, in our country. Of course, uh, because it's there, we have already done uh, analysis and of course we have uh, observational evidence and uh, of course our sectors are also replete with the impacts of uh, climate change and therefore I, I start with uh, what we have done to, to address that and um, Kenya has a, a climate change act that was uh, enacted in 2016 uh, ideally I've summarized in the first uh, first uh, first uh, paragraph it's an act of parliament to provide for a regulatory framework for enhanced response to climate change 
and to provide for mechanisms and measures to achieve low carbon climate development and of course uh, other connected purposes. And uh, of course it commenced in 2016 after presidential ascent. And we have also of course uh, to resonate with that of course a national uh, climate change framework policy and also a national climate change finance policy that are already in place. And of course uh, all these uh, tools are in line with our constitution. So the indicative objectives of the Climate Change Act, and I will, of course I will link this to the NDC, you might wonder where I'm going. Of course it's to support Kenya to achieve low carbon climate resilient development and to mainstream climate change uh, responses across uh, all the sectors of uh, our economy through planning, decision making, budgeting, and uh, implementation. And of course also to mainstream climate change into dis disaster risk uh, response actions, among others. And uh, of course also to link it with the sustainable development. And of course, uh, again, not to, be, uh, not, not to leave out issues of uh, gender and uh, intergenerational equity. We have not just talked about gender, we have also looked at the different age groups, how we can move with them, uh, along with them. The Act, of course, supports climate change resilience building and enhancing of capacity, uh, adaptive capacity across the different sectors. And it provides incentives and uh, obligations, of course, uh, for private sector actors. And lastly, of course, uh, it facilitates public participation. We have made it uh, just uh, reiterated what is cast in our constitution that uh, public participation, of course, uh, should determine the threshold of, uh, uh, of course, uh, of decision making in matters climate change. Our National Climate Change Action Plan is actually angered in the Climate Change Act as a five-year iterative tool for the mainstream of climate change actions across the different sectors. And uh, at all levels of government, we have got two, uh, a devolved government system with one national government and 47 county governments. And we want to move with all those uh, institutions, of course, as we address climate change, even as we do assessments like uh, vulnerability and adaptation assessments or analysis. And of course, uh, we are bound by law, of course, to revise the action plan every five years. And this must involve uh, meaningful public participation at all levels of government. And uh, of course, uh, we have just, the, the, our first action plan was for the period uh, June of uh, 20, July of 2013 up to June of uh, this year. And uh, that has already lapsed, and we have just completed, of course, the development of our next cycle of the action plan, which is for the period Ju July this year up to June of uh, 2023. That's how we call them. It, looks, it says 20, 2018 to 2022. But the, it's financial year that starts uh, July of 2022. It ends, of course, uh, in uh, June of 2023. And, of course, uh, our action plan also has been, the second action plan, of course, has been supported, of course, uh, by the NDC partnership, of course, uh, and the NDC hub, of course, uh, is part of the NDC partnership. Adapt our adaptation actions are also cast, of course, and further refined into our national adaptation plan, which spans for the, uh, from the year 2015 to 2030. That's our NDC, and ideally the message I want to, uh, to, to shout, of course, uh, to everyone is that uh, our NDC has an adaptation and mitigation components. It's a deliberate uh, statement by the country to address uh, adaptation and mitigation on equal footing or on equal consideration for national good, even before we respond to any international obligations. And therefore, you can start understanding why I started with the act, uh, act because the act angers our National Climate Change Action Plan, and uh, our NDC forms part of the National Climate Change Action Plan because, of course, the NDC can, cannot cover every imaginable need with respect to climate change. Of course, uh, our NDC responds to Kenya's unique uh, national circumstances, including its vulnerability levels and its manifestation, of course, across the different sectors, uh, sectors of our economy. It's in line with our vision 2030, which is the blueprint for development up to 2030, and also our constitution. And it's angered, of course, in the action plan, the Climate Change Act of 2016, 
and it recognizes uh, individual and corporate action at all levels. I'm saying this deliberately because uh, we work with all the stakeholders. We, wor we work with the uh, government stakeholders. We work with non-governmental -gov uh, uh, stakeholders, of course, the so-called uh, non-state actors, including the private sector. We work with, the na of course, uh, with CSOs and NGOs, faith-based organizations, among others, because we know they have a stake in uh, the cause of climate change and therefore also in uh, the, resp the, the, the requisite response actions. For now, we have just completed actually an NDC and action plan coordination uh, framework with our private sector actors and uh, it's about to be signed off. It's supposed to be signed. The agreement was to sign it off with, uh, from our cabinet sector, our minister, signing it off, on, of, co of course, on behalf of the government. While all the CEOs of the umbrella bodies representing the private sector will sign it off and uh, it's going to be done soon. We have just done our first iteration. Some of the lessons learned, of course, uh, one, I, I think to me this is uh, important, I just picked a few. Policy and legal frameworks, of course, uh, eliminate the risk of uh, relying on uh, individual goodwill. And of course, uh, it also uh, promotes sustainability, of course, in terms of uh, institutionalization and of course, uh, continued climate change uh, or sustained climate change act uh, response actions. I'm saying this deliberately because uh, during the time, the time period of our first action plan, we did not have any legal framework, of course, with any ob obligation to mainstream climate change uh, in uh, any sector. But therefore, at that period, we did some level of uh, mainstreaming. What we call mainstreaming is what others will easily call uh, integration of climate change consideration, of course, in planning, budgeting, and implementation. And therefore, at that period, we appreciate that we were able to achieve some level of mainstreaming, but we did not do as much as we would have expected to do because there was no legal obligation. Right now, and therefore, we relied actually on the goodwill of the, uh, the, the, the CEO or the accounting officer of the Ministry of uh, Planning for National Development then. And uh, we, we are happy with what we achieved with that. But then it's not enough. Right now, it was easier for us, of course, as the ministry responsible for the coordination of climate change affairs, uh, because the minister responsible for planning by law is obligated to ensure the integration of climate change in planning. And therefore, he actually formed, uh, established a climate change uh, thematic working group to work with all the sector, uh, sector working groups to ensure climate change is mainstreamed across the different uh, sectors. And one, because uh, it's good for the country, and two, because it's also a legal expectation that will also require reporting after every two years. Because uh, every two years, the, 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 the Climate Change Act obligates every sector ministry to report to the National Climate Change Council, which is chaired by the president. And uh, the report, of course, is submitted to parliament for consideration and advice. And they are supposed to report on the mainstreaming of the climate change, the climate, national climate change action in their sectors, what they have done to ensure low carbon development, of course, uh, low greenhouse gas uh, uh, emissions uh, development, and uh, the, uh, the building of uh, adaptive capacity in their sectors. And therefore, the, the, that one is a, a lesson that we have learned. We have also learned, of course, that sensitization can break every barrier because, uh, again, many times we look at stakeholders, we go out to talk to other non-state non actors as government, forgetting the fact that at, at least some of the guys who need to be educated and sensitized are actually from within the government. And therefore, we have learned to, to, to accommodate uh, through sensitization all our stakeholders and to carry them along. And this we have done even with members of parliament because uh, they would easily throw out uh, something that is uh, good for the country if they do not understand the issues. But once they understand the issues, then they will actually become champions of climate change in the National Assembly or in the Senate or whatever uh, legis uh, legislative assemblies we have. Of course, the climate change can deliver also very tangible developmental benefits. And uh, this, uh, of course, uh, is something that I do not need to belabor. And then every, each and every stakeholder, of course, has a role. They have a stake in the cause of climate change, and therefore we should create space, deliberately create space as governments, of course, to accommodate each one of them because they have a role. And then, of course, multilateral decisions can sound very exciting. I remember when we signed, of course, we, we agreed on the Paris Agreement and the ululation on the whole. 
but then it means nothing to, at the domestic level unless it's translated into domestic action through a process of domestication, as we have done that, of course, by through the Climate Change Act, because then it binds us to implement every climate change-related multilateral agreement uh, that uh, Kenya has signed uh, or, uh, or, 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 of course, uh, ratified. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen. That was very innovative. Yeah. Let's very quickly go to Vanuatu. Please give us the status of what is happening there. Thank you, uh, colleagues. I have a PowerPoint presentation. I hope that can come up on the screen. I'd just like to set the context of this presentation. The IPCC 1.5 report has made it crystal clear that we are on the cusp of devastation in the Pacific Islands. There is urgency that we have never seen before. The leaders of the Pacific Islands in September of this year made an unprecedented declaration that climate change represents the single greatest threat to our livelihoods, our security, and the well-being of Pacific Island peoples. And that is why the NDC is the tool, the essential tool, that is going to get us back from this threshold. NDCs are self-determined, but what is an NDC with self-determination if that leads to extinction? Right now, we're on a pathway to three degrees temperature rise, and that is completely unacceptable in the Pacific Islands. And that's why I'm so excited to talk to you today about a Pacific NDC hub, which we've established with 14 Pacific Island countries. This NDC hub uh, is built on the Pacific's action already by submitting INDCs. We immediately started to implement those INDCs, putting together roadmaps, projects, and investment plans. But I have to say that those first NDCs were rushed. We did this in a very quick, time frame without consideration of all sectors. Uh, most of them, for example, were only based on energy. Uh, we completely didn't uh, incorporate agriculture, land use. And so really, we need to raise the level of ambition. And that's why this Pacific NDC hub is going to help us expand the scope of our existing NDCs, enhance the targets, and add new elements that we missed the first time around. Now, I'd like to take you through the process of how we set up this Pacific NDC hub. Back in 2017, uh, the members raised the need to have a regional space where countries in similar contexts could seek guidance and support to strengthen NDCs. Now, we have the NDC partnership at the global level, but it was critical that we had a regional space to discuss the, our needs and issues. Then at COP23, the Fiji presidency launched the Pacific NDC hub, and we've been working very hard since. In fact, just a few months ago, uh, we clarified the legal arrangements and the very uh, specific topics that we would focus on. So the NDC hub in the Pacific, uh, the objective is to enhance and help us implement the NDCs that we have, driving sustainable and resilient development so that we get the transition that we need for that low carbon uh, development pathway. Uh, this is a collaborative effort, not only among the 14 Pacific Island countries, but also among a number of development partners, specifically the uh, SPC, the Pacific Community, SPREP, which is the regional uh, environment program, the NDC partnership, of course, at the global level, GGGI and GIZ. And we thank them all very much. The initial funding of just around 2 million uh, euros from Australia, Germany, and the UK got us kick-started on this process. And unfortunately, that's only enough to take us through the first phase, which will end in 2020, but we're very much aiming to have a second phase through 2025. The Pacific Hub is different in that it is owned, managed, guided by the Pacific Island countries. This is our space, our needs, our requirements. It is demand-driven, and it's meant to be more timely and more relevant than any other mechanisms for support that we currently have. Now, the objective are many. Uh, the first is that we get this NDC hub operational, and we're expecting that uh, in 2019, quarter one. The second is that we get our current NDCs fully reviewed, and so we can identify those areas for enhancement. We need investment plans. NDCs are nothing without the money behind them. So where are the investment, strategic investment areas? Of course, leveraging finance for our NDCs, uh, getting guidance and technical assistance, 
and then finally sharing information, peer-to-peer south-south cooperation on NDCs in the Pacific. This is what we're aiming to do with our Pacific hub. Now, we expect to have all of this ready by the first quarter of 2019. What are some of the activities that we expect this regional hub to do for Pacific Island countries? First of all, undertake a lot of the policy analysis that needs to be done. Where are those gaps? The implementation roadmaps, uh, investment plans and re uh, regulatory frameworks that are missing. Secondly, data, particularly around monitoring uh, and evaluation. Developing indicators for ND NDCs that are very specific and very targeted to sectors. Partnerships, not only within the Pacific Islands, but among development partners regionally and internationally. And of course, as I've mentioned, this peer-to-peer -peer learning. Countries will have a direct line to request support from the NDC hub, and they'll be responded to uh, immediately by people who they know and they trust. So next steps, uh, the funding arrangements have been uh, organized and we're setting up the, the office as we speak, uh, hiring managers and staff for the hub. Uh, the regional technical support mechanism is where countries can request for technical support. We're reviewing that and bringing that into the hub. The processes for actually requesting support. Can a single country request 10, 10 items or should we have processes to screen uh, and request? And then finally getting those first country requests in by the end of quarter one, 2019. Now, from Vanuatu's perspective, uh, as I've said, ambition is essential. Unless we can start to ramp up the ambition in our NDCs, we are all lost. It's not just the developing countries, it's not just the SIDS or the LDCs, it is every single person on this planet. And so the NDC is the mechanism. We need to be much higher ambition, we need to have economy-wide targets with all sectors involved, with bankable project pipelines that involve the private sector, CSOs, and the public sector. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Chris. That is uh, quite a detailed list of where we need to be. Uh, now call on Crispin to give us the Caribbean perspective. Uh, we have a PowerPoint for him. Thank you, Davina, and good day, everybody. It's one minute to midday, so I can say good afternoon. Um, yes, so I'm Crispin Dovern. I'm with the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, or so OECS Commission. And um, I'm going to speak about the NDC Finance Initi Initiative for the Caribbean, NDCFI. So on screen, you can see a number of dots, which is islands which, cons which comprise the, the um, which, are, which are included in the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. We are 10 countries, Antigua, Anguilla, Antigua and Barbuda, Dominica, Grenada, St. Kitts, and Nevis, St. Lucia, Montserrat, um, St. Lucia, did I mention St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, British Virgin Islands, and um, we, of these six are sovereign countries that are all party to, to the Paris Agreement and to the, the Convention. Um, the British Virgin Islands, Anguilla and Montserrat are um, UK overseas territories and Martinique is, is the Department of France. Now, just to echo our, my, predecessor, my immediate predecessor, I just want to say that our first NDCs were rather rushed because we had a relatively narrow timeline to get them ready and there was a focus on mitigation at the time. And it, that, that plays out clearly in, in our NDCs. Now, a number of countries are, try, are taking steps to, to map out NDC implementation and also looking towards, towards the, the enhancement and strengthening of these NDCs to make them more robust and to, and to provide more specific guidance in terms of adaptation, for example. Now, what are some of the key sectors that come out? Again, as I said, the focus was, was on mitigation at the time, uh, more, than, more so than adaptation. And the transport and, and, and energy sectors came out very strongly. Water also came out as cross-cutting, as did um, coastal zone, uh, land use and, and forestry, we also had health, tourism, waste management, and the built envir environment. Agriculture was also an issue. The, in terms of the, the actual costings for the NDCs, most of the countries did not put, provide any costings for adaptation. The, there was qu quite a bit of discussion in the NDCs on, on adaptation, but there was very little in terms of costing because in the time, in the time span, even if we had decided to focus on, on, on adaptation, 
in the time span to cost, for example, restoration or, or, you know, of, or protection of coral reefs and so on would be a much more elaborate process than costing, um, you know, solar, solar panels and, you know, or solar plants and, and um, wind farms and so on, where you, it's relatively, I see, relatively easy to, to, pull it, to put these figures together. So in terms of implementation, as I said, a number of countries are actually, countries have sought to take meaningful steps towards NDC implementation. And even the non-independent member states have also demonstrated a, com a commitment to take actions that are confluent with the aims of the Paris Agreement and NDC objectives. And the OECS Commission, for whom I work, has endeavored to support member states in their efforts to accelerate NDC implementation with ministerial endorsement. In 2017 and 2018, the Council of Ministers on, Env on Environmental Sustainability for the OECS gave us the mandate to, to provide that kind of support. And in 2017, the OECS and the Government of St. Lucia, in partnership with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, with initial support from GIZ and under the auspices of the NDC partnership, embarked on, on, on an initiative to accelerate NDC implementation. So what is now known as the NDC Finance Initiative, or NDCFI, was launched in September 2017. So what is the NDC, NDCFI? It is a regional hub for climate action. The NDCFI is a regional cross-sector and multi-partite stakeholder consultation and engagement process to support ambitions for climate leadership in the Caribbean. It is a regional platform for learning and support on project preparation and access to finance to accelerate NDC implementation. The NDCFI seeks to, among other th things, facilitate inclusive participation in shaping climate-driven transformation across the OECS, build capacity commitment, cap capacity commitment and collaboration for climate action and policy harmonization, address bottlenecks in project development, and increase the availability of investable projects, improve access to finance for projects that accelerate NDC implementation and build resilience, and establish a regional hub at the OECS for NDC-related information and support, peer learning, coordination on policy challenges, and an inventory of NDC-related initiatives, tools, and capacity. One of the, the milestones that we've celebrated is the first NDC forum, NDCFI forum, which was held in St. Lucia on the 11th and 12th of October 2018 in St. Lucia. The forum, it, it brought together over 130 participants from almost 30 countries from the OECS, the wider Caribbean, and beyond. And it brought people from government, the multilateral, um, the, the, the development community, multilateral development agencies, the private sector from the Caribbean and beyond, um, NGOs, CSOs, and so on. And it demonstrated the convening power of the OECS. It confirmed demand for regional engagement and action. It initiated an inclusive engagement process and non-traditional dialogue across key stakeholder groups and sectors. It garnered high-level commitment with significant ministerial and other high-level participation and a ministerial declaration. And it confirmed the commitment to leadership on mitigation and underlined the urgent need to expand focus and action on adaptation and resilience. In terms of the roadmap, what is, what is planned for 2019? It is intended to operationalize a vision for a regionally determined contribution, not a legally binding RDC, but an aspirational one where we, where we pull our collective efforts. And um, that will serve to accelerate the implementation of NDCs, building on opportunities for regional coordination, learning and resource pooling, enhancing the NDCFI multipartite conversation on climate leadership in the Caribbean. Continue, expand and enhance the NDCFI working group process. And we establish working groups basically to, to, to do the groundwork ahead of the forum to look at the key sectors. We, we, had, we identified three sectors to work with in the first instance, which was energy, including transport, water, and other critical infrastructure. And these working groups were drawn from governments, from the private sector, and so on, to, to lay down the groundwork, to do the, you know, to, to, to the initial assessments, and so on. And um, the intention is to continue, expand, and enhance the, that working group process. Build capacity within the public and private sectors is another um, objective. Support, sorry, improve national and regional policy and legislative environments. And just by way of one example, in some countries where you may want to promote um, investment in, say, geothermal, which is something that is attracting some interest in the, in the Eastern Caribbean in particular, 
the legislation only permits one one provi one provider of, electri of, el of electricity services, and um, very often these but these state-owned or, or, or um, these national utilities do not have the wherewithal to, to, to do the inv that kind of investment or even the exploration. So that is you know that is an issue. So there are policy and legislative barriers. Um, in support baseline development and national planning. It's one thing to say, yeah, yeah, I need geothermal, I need solar, but how much do you need? And, you know, and where do you need it? That kind of baseline assessment is necessary and has not been done in all the countries. Um, develop project portfolios and an NDCFI marketplace to connect projects with available money. To explore opportunities for alignments with efforts to implement the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol to accelerate climate ac action in the Caribbean. And we plan to convene a second NDC forum in the fourth quarter of 2019. Um, so some of the things that we found already is that, yes, there, there is an appetite in the private sector. The private sector has been relatively slow on, in coming on board because for many years, climate change was seen as the domain or the purview of government and, you know, the government negotiates and the government is going to get funding, the government is going to solve the problems. But that is one of the things that, that we've learned, that there, there is an appetite, but there is a need to build the knowledge and build the capacity in the private sector. Um, and there's, the other issue is... Another issue is how to incentivize adaptation in areas, you know, where you you basically protecting you know public assets or public goods, whether it's you know it's coral reefs or you know mangroves or that kind of thing. So you know these kind of investments are, are, are typically seen as as areas for governments to invest in. Um, so I think I'm going to end there in the interest of time, but there's a lot more that can be said, and so I just I think all that's left is for me to say thank you at this time. Well, thank you so much, Crispin, for that uh, detailed uh, Caribbean perspective. And I think, let me, let's give a round of applause to our country perspectives. I, I think this has been enriching. I think there's a lot that is going to give the second panel, which is now the people that are supporting the countries get this work delivered. What is testimony today is there's a lot of groundwork happening. I mean, this is from the three regions. These are from developing states trying to do something about climate change, and this is very commendable. Thank you very much. We'll now shift and change panels, and uh, we'll hear from another panel. In the meantime, we want to engage the audience. We're going to have a slido.com opinion. If you take off your phones, please log on and respond to that question. Log on with your phones and immediately do that. And then we'll shift this panel and invite the next panel on top. If you could do that with your phones, log on. Yes, uh, yeah. Si ça se referme, tu appuies juste sur ce bouton-là, là, et ça va l'ouvrir, OK? Il n'y a pas de mot de passe, t'inquiète pas. Well, thank you. Uh, are you responding? 
Is it active? We want to hear from you, the audience. It's lunchtime. Let's get uh, active. So it's a sliders just to get our audience to give us some bit of feedback. But in the meantime, thank you very much for responding to our invitation to come and share experience. We have with us, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Cameron Diver, the Deputy Director General for the Pacific Community. Thank you, sir. We have my good friend, we've worked a lot together. Jahan, I think everybody knows you. Jahan Chaudhry, the Country Engagement Director, NDC Partnership Support Unit. He's the one who has the whip. He gets us all, I don't know how many calls I get from you. What are you doing, Ray? You're not responding. And then we have uh, Dr. Frank Rice Berman, got it right, Director General GGGI. Thank you very much. And then I have my colleague, good friend, Ahmed al Kaber, Islamic Development Bank. He's the manager for climate change. And with us today, we have the Africa Group of negotiators representative. So I, th I think she'll give us a feel on the issues that Vanuatu was trying to raise, the previous, uh, uh, the previous uh, speakers raised about negotiations. I think there's a sense of urgency on what needs to be done. And then least but not least, we have Julia Wolf from FAO. These are all partners. These are the people that are helping countries get it all done together. Let's hear from you. I'll start with you, Cameron. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm afraid that I may have to dash after my intervention because I'm also supposed to be moderating another side event that starts in around about five minutes. Uh, so please forgive me for absenting myself uh, reasonably swiftly. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here uh, on behalf of uh, the Pacific community uh, alongside uh, some of the partners that are going to help us make the Pacific Regional NDC Hub uh, a reality for the countries of the Pacific region. Uh, one of the important goals of the Pacific Regional NDC Hub is that we want to place the needs of Pacific Island countries right at the center of our approach uh, to work. And we can achieve this, and we're starting to achieve this already, in, in some of the following ways. First of all, the idea of the Pacific Regional NDC Hub actually originated through calls from Pacific Island countries for a platform that would support them in implementing and in enhancing their NDCs. So this wasn't something that came from uh, international public servants sitting in an office somewhere thinking this would be a wonderful idea. It really came from the voice of our member states in the Pacific, and that's a critical component uh, of both ownership and of success. When we conceptualized the hub, all Pacific Island countries were also consulted on the type of support that they required. And this feedback was grouped into five main categories, reviewing and enhancing NDCs, developing NDC implementation roadmaps, leveraging finance for NDCs, which you will know is extremely important because without money, all of the talk and all of the ambition uh, will be for naught because we do need increased finance targeted to NDC implementation and upscaling ambition, uh, mainstreaming NDCs into existing national plans, and sharing knowledge and information uh, on NDC implementation. And our hub's work will be based on one priority request for support provided by Pacific Island countries to deliver their most urgently needed support as soon as possible. Once the hub's fully operational, and we hope that that will be early in the new year, uh, an online system is going to be set up to make sure that Pacific Island countries can make requests for exactly the form of NDC-related support that they require. Uh, and uh, that will be the basis of the work that the hub will take forward. And finally, uh, the Pacific Regional NDC hub is guided by a steering committee uh, that is made up of one representative from each sub-region within the Pacific, so from Micronesia, from Melanesia, from Polynesia, and a representative from uh, Fiji. And uh, this steering committee is going to be central, again, in ensuring country voices and ownership in shaping the work as we take it forward. 
Uh, obviously, above and beyond the work that we'll do in individual countries, we're looking to help strengthen uh, the regional approach and regional capacity to NDC implementation uh, and enhancement. Uh, one of the first goals will obviously be to strengthen the regional technical support mechanism, which is a database that's going to provide uh, a broad overview of all of the experts that exist uh, in the region who can be hired as consultants to work on projects. That will allow us to procure experts through this system uh, to provide the experience that's necessary and also contextually appropriate support because these will be experts that have knowledge of the region's specific context. And once again, all of you who work in sustainable development will know how important it is to get experts who know what the social, the political, the cultural context is on the ground in the region that you're working in so that you don't simply take a paradigm that works in one part of the world and try and say, because this works in Africa, in Latin America, or in Asia, this will work in the Pacific. That is wrong, and truly sustainable development needs to be completely contextualized to the needs of the people and the countries that you're working with, and we're going to try to do that uh, through our NDC hub. Uh, in terms of best practice, uh, we feel that it's incredibly important to share knowledge and experience uh, to help each other in achieving our common goal of NDC implementation. And as our hub is in the early stages, uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to learn from the African and Caribbean hubs that are already working to support their member countries. And once again, this is why it's important to be plugged into a global network of hubs, to have global partners uh, like the NDC Partnership, GGGI, and others that are with us, uh, because one region working alone won't be able to get to the level of ambition that we want, and each of the hubs is part of a global network that is there to ensure global implementation and global scaling up uh, of nationally determined contributions and the ambition that goes with that. Uh, Following this discussion, obviously, and following COP24, uh, we are really looking forward to continuing to work with Africa, with the Caribbean, and obviously very closely with our member countries to make sure that we can deliver on the promise of the nationally determined contributions and what actually lies behind that, which is once again that scaled up ambition and meeting that ambition for the good of our region and the good of our planet. Thank you very much for your time and for your attention. Uh, it's unfortunate you won't be joining us for the moderated panel session, which is what we're going to do now. If you have five minutes, you can stay on. But I'll turn to Jahan and ask Jahan to give us, to set the scene for us, the one year, two years now, that uh, the partnership has been engaging across different regions. What has been your experience? Where, where do you see this network of hubs? Uh, where do you see where would you want it to get to? And what has been your, your feel on having them on the ground? Thank you. I cannot see everyone from there, so I want to really connect with the audience. I'm not going to be talking about the NDC partnership. I'm not going to be talking about the hub. Instead, I'll be talking about some of the challenges that we are seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. I have three messages. The first one, it's important to converge. The second message is, it's very important to leverage. And the third message is, it's very important to deliver with speed. Let me explain you, ladies and gentlemen, what I mean by this. First, converge. Why do we need to converge? We are seeing a trend in most of the developing countries, particularly in Africa. The trend is the withdrawal of sector budget support and general budget support. And it has got a huge implication on the fiscal space of the developing countries. Before, when we had more ODA going to sector budget support and general support, we had platforms for policy dialogues at the country level. We had platforms to have a discussion about the sectoral policies, about the challenges, about the opportunities between the development partners and the government, government representing various different sectors. Unfortunately, we have lost that to a large extent. And as a result, 
most of the things that we are noticing on the ground is just so project specific that we are so focused on little projects that we are here and doing here and there that we are losing that macro perspective. We're losing that programmatic perspective. And this is the reason it's important to bring the development partners and the government, the sectoral ministries together under one single framework. Is it possible? Yes, we have done this in 15 different countries from the NDC partnership side by coming up with what we call a partnership plan where we have demands coming from the government and the supply services coming from the development partners. And our job is basically to connect these two entities so we have a much better programmatic perspective of the work that is going on the ground. The second challenge that we are noticing is <clears throat> the lack of engagement or limited engagement from planning and finance ministries. I will consider a COP successful when I see 50% of the representatives are actually coming from planning and finance ministries. Till that day, we have a huge challenge ahead of us. What we are noticing is, when it comes to the mainstreaming of SDGs, because the planning and finance ministries are so familiar with the MDG concept and the natural evolution of MDGs to SDGs, that it's much easier for them to integrate SDGs into the planning process, into the budgeting process, into the public investment programming. And also the aid architecture, as you know, is tied to the SDGs, not necessarily NDCs. Now, if we are missing this planning cycle of SDG mainstreaming, if you are missing this planning cycle of development planning reformulation or formulation of development planning, the new generation of them, then we have to wait for another three to five years to mainstream NDCs. So we need to bring the finance planning ministries much closer to this NDC dialogue. The third is the disconnection between public sector and the private sector. What we would really like to see is synchronized dancing between private sector and the private, uh, public sector. Unfortunately, we are not necessarily seeing this. Either the NDCs do not have enough measurability, they do not have the necessary shape and scope that would be appealing to the private sector, or the private sector is coming in late into the discussion, almost like an afterthought. So how can we bring the public and private sector together? And ladies and gentlemen, this is a discussion that we have been having since 1990s. It's nothing new, but we are still struggling to bring the private sector, primarily perhaps that we are not in a position yet to convert these NDCs into key bankable projects. I know a lot of organizations are working on this, but how do we make sure these bankable projects are seeing the deal closure? So that's, that's, the, that's the reason why we say it's important to bring convergence into this debate. The second is about leveraging resources, very much related to what I discussed about the private sector. We all know there's a plenty of money out there. The way there's also plenty of water out there, but not all water is drinkable. What we are really seeing is a very uncertain macroeconomic situation. Look what happened in uh, London last Thursday. 56 billion pounds worth of stock was wiped out from the market. So it's a very unpredictable situation, and that is exactly similar amount of the GDP of Kenya. 50 million people earning the wealth that was created is equivalent to 56 billion pounds worth of stock being wiped out from the UK market. We are also seeing a huge amount of debt that both the government and the private sector they're incurring. And what is worrying about this new debt structure is most of the debt is actually in the private sector and most of the debt is national debt, meaning that they are accumulating this debt from the national commercial banks. And this can put us in a very vulnerable situation. One more financial crisis, we will be sure that we are going to be off track from our NDC target. 
So what can we do about making sure that we are leveraging resources? We are making sure that the development plan partners are coming forward, putting upfront investment to take off the risk from the private sector. So that's another thing, area where we are increasingly trying to make sure that there's a connection, there's leveraging of resources, and to also importantly see that we, we move away or we at least zoom out from a purely climate perspective. Otherwise, we are going to be lost in the woods and we will not be able to see the forest that we need to see. And the third one is about the speed of delivery. Again, very important. Uh, Davina was mentioning at the beginning of this, uh, of this panel discussion that we need to be relevant. The only way we can be relevant when it comes to NDC implementation is by demonstrating speed. In many countries, what we are seeing is that although our countries are requesting for support in NDC mainstreaming into the sectoral planning process, into their current budgeting cycle, we are not necessarily seeing the same level of speed coming from the development partners. And again, if you don't take this opportunity now, you have to wait for another three to four years. And by then, the services that you have to offer would be irrelevant. So again, very important to bring speed into this picture. So going back to what I said, convergence is important, leveraging is important, and speed of delivery is important. And all these three can be addressed by the hubs. Hub have the potential to reduce the opportunity cost for the countries, so rather than going to 16 different multi, uh, development partners, you can go to just one hub, and then hub can be the clearing house for you to respond to your needs with speed. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Jahan. I think that sets us in the mood to listen to our next uh, panel members. Let me call on you, Frank. You've been at this for many, many years. You saw countries through their green growth strategies. Just uh, mold it for us. What is at stake? Where do we need to be? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think I'll stay seated. I can see you from here. Uh, and let me say that I've been at it for a long time. Uh, the Green Growth Institute, GDGI, is still a very young organization. We were set up only six years ago, but we now have uh, 30 member countries. We're an intergovernmental organization and another 30 countries on the way to their membership. Uh, and I'm very pleased to say that we are an official partner of the NDC hub in the Pacific. You actually witnessed while Johan was speaking uh, a very efficient si signing ceremony where we signed the MOU between SPC and GGI and the other partners to officially kick off the NDC hub. We're also very happy to uh, partner and support the African Development Bank in the uh, NDC hub for Africa and work this year on a project to jointly assess the readiness for NDCs in seven African countries. And we are indeed also a partner with OECS to support the uh, NDCs in the Caribbean as well. So this is a very relevant event Indeed, as Davina said, in a number of cases, we started to work with governments on national green growth strategies. This was before the Paris Agreement was signed, before the global goals were agreed. But we found in a number of countries that had such national green growth strategies that they were in a very good position to come up with strong NDCs because they had a national green growth strategy which laid out their foundations. So Ethiopia felt it was not so difficult for them to actually had a good first generation NDCs because it was based on their climate resilient green economy strategy. In other countries, indeed, government signed up to the INDCs that were more aspirational, more a line in the sand. And we were very happy that when uh, Fiji became the COP23 chair, we supported them in then translating that INDC into a more concrete uh, NDC roadmap last year. And in fact, Fiji wanted to be more ambitious, and this year they developed uh, LEDs, a low emission development strategy for 2050 that government will present here later this week. So indeed we see a very close alignment between these national green growth strategies that countries keep developing 
Uganda, for instance, more recently developed the Uganda Green Growth Development Strategy. But that is then the basis for its NDC actions as well as their pathway to SDGs. So we see on the planning side a very good linkage. And indeed, uh, it, that kind of planning is then a good basis for more targeted policy actions. We just came from the low carbon development event from Indonesia, for instance, where we discussed what governments can do to promote crowding in of the private sector that Johan just addressed. Quite a few governments still have fossil fuel subsidies, for instance, or they don't have the right kind of policies to support renewable energy where it is only marginally effective. So governments can do quite a lot in specific policy actions to promote the NDC implementation. But in the end, I think it is critical that we see private investment into this space. And the good news is that particularly in the SIDS or in LDCs where often uh, you know, diesel generated energy is the baseline or the alternative, diesel generated energy is actually expensive. When you are in small islands and people have only diesel generated energy, they pay a high price for that energy. And it is already commercially attractive to replace diesel with solar, even solar plus batteries as backup. So that's the news that still surprises many, that it is actually commercially attractive to replace diesel energy with solar plus batteries. Often then in small island, the projects are too small to interest the private sector. So then financing becomes critical to be able to structure these projects. For instance, bring enough small island projects together so that you get up to 10 or 15 megawatt uh, so that you can get a private developer to come directly to the table. But while we haven't done that much work in the Caribbean, you might be surprised to hear that this year in Guyana, where we worked for the first time with government, government has a grid nominally, but because it isn't very stable, many businesses own diesel generators to back up the grid or to use during power outages, a situation that I think is going to be familiar to many of you. So in a situation like that, rooftop solar is already commercially attractive. This year we put together for the capital with a number of businesses about 14 megawatts of solar rooftop power for which we could find a private developer come straight to the table, work with those businesses to introduce uh, solar on rooftops. So that again is, I think, a situation that we see as commercially attractive for many SIDS and for many LDCs. Uh, and indeed where the NDC hubs can share that kind of experience or guide governments in setting up the right kind of, uh, if you like, policies that are encouraging. There are still quite a few utilities that are so scared of, if you like, rooftop solar that uh, they say if you put rooftop, if you put solar on your rooftops, we'll disconnect you from the grid. Because they're worried that rooftop solar will actually make their grid less stable. Now, that was true a handful of years ago, but by now, uh, the way we can connect uh, even solar or wind to the grid, uh, particularly if we can add some batteries to it, uh, we can actually help stabilize grids. We can actually make that commercially attractive investments. So while there are a lot of challenges, uh, there are also some real opportunities for private sector investments that we can capitalize on. But because these are new, because not all governments are in involved, informed and have the right policies in place, I see a lot of scope for regional learning through NDC hubs, as we are discussing here today. So I think these regional hubs are very powerful ways for particularly smaller countries where capacity is, of course, always uh, a challenge, where there isn't that much scale in government to uh, learn on a national basis. Uh, so yes, we see a lot of scope for uh, NDC hubs as we are discussing today, and I'd like to congratulate these regions in uh, taking proactive action and to see real ownership of the countries uh, in each of these regions and we are very ready to support uh, and help attract 
finance, and I su suspect that our next panelist will talk more about the role of those financing agencies that I think can play a key role uh, mobilizing that finance as well. Now, can I end with a last plea to say that while green and climate finance is very important, it should really not be the goal. Rather, we see a lot of scope for blended finance where, can I say, every dollar of funding from the Green Climate Fund or from the African Development Bank or from the Islamic Development Bank should really be leveraged. I think we should have a goal that every dollar of that concessional finance should mobilize $10 in private sector finance. So maybe I can give that as a, a message to comment on by uh, our colleagues on the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Frank. That was very good. Um, I will call upon Ahmed, Ahmed being the development finance uh, representative on this uh, panel. Give us some of the activities, some of the, how you see as, as a financier, as a, a development bank, how do you see or which activities would actually make the work of the NDC uh, hubs relevant? Because the issue is how do we become relevant? Thank you. Um, thank you, Davina, and uh, thank you to the African Development Bank for hosting this event and the great work they've been doing with the Africa NDC hub in general. I also want to thank the colleagues on the panel who made my life easier because they alluded to all of the things that I wanted to say, actually. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, that, thank you. You make my life easier. Um, one of the things I would like to, I, if you're not familiar with the Islamic Development Bank, we're a multilateral development bank. We work in 57 countries. And uh, similar to all other multilateral development banks, African, uh, World Bank, Asian Development Bank, climate change is really high up on our agenda. And it is a strategic priority for the bank. Uh, one thing I wanted to start with, Davina, and similar to all other uh, MDBs, is this linkages between the SDGs and NDCs. Our work at the end of the day is around development. These are not two different agendas. We see them uh, fully line in line, uh, fully aligned. And any efforts that replicate or that don't link them uh, could actually be a waste. We really see uh, the work on NDCs and actualizing NDCs, our country's NDCs and ambitions toward climate action as also part of reaching the SDGs. For example, we cannot think of renewable energy or energy efficiency without thinking in how could it be part of the country's plans to reach low carbon development or have a, a highly resilient uh, pathway, go through uh, development resilient, uh, resilient pathways. For example, water efficiency, uh, uh, SDGs 11 and 9, infrastructure and cities, public transport, all of these are things that we would want to see. Of course, naturally, they uh, help reach SDGs, a SDG targets, but would naturally be seen at NDCs. So for us, this link is natural. And this is part of the thing, before going to the financing part, this is part of the dialogue now we're having with our member countries. First, we want to have it internally with our uh, country, st country managers, with our sector people who work on SDG goals, but we also have with our countries. And this is a key role that the NDC hub, Africa NDC hub, the NDC partnership actually bring. Now, my colleague Frank said this is very important for small countries. Actually, it's even more important for larger countries. We're representatives of ministries of finance, ministries of environment, ministries of energy, or ministries of transport, have no way of properly, effectively communicating with each other, sometimes, not always, of course, but we have to make sure that these strategies and national plans, those national commitments are aligned. So one thing, for example, we bring here, during this past year, we've updated how we do our country engagement. Most of us, uh, must, uh, us uh, multilateral development bank, have what we call as uh, member country partnership strategies, where we define our engagement for the next, let's say, three to five years. Now, one of the things we did in our diagnostics, we want to make sure that we look into the NDCs, we look at the uh, VNRs of this country, and make sure that they are as aligned as could be, and then identify the gaps. So that when we're having the dialogue with the Ministry of Energy, the Ministry of Transport, the Ministry of Environment, we make sure that these plans are aligned and, they're not, and that we're not replicating efforts, and that all of these are aligned in the national plans of these countries. This is the only way we could actually reach the climate change goals or even the SDG goals. There is so little we can do and the resources, as you know, we have as MDBs, even with all the leveraging we can do, 
are quite limited. So if we're not very strategic in how we approach our member countries and linking those two agendas, we will never be able to reach these goals. So we also have financial tools, as you mentioned. Now, one of the things that people expect from us is be speaking about financing. I don't know if I'll get a chance, Davina, to replicate, but maybe I'll touch on that, some of the tools that we mentioned. P part of our mandate now, we are thinking, we have revisited how we approach, and we are after private sector-induced development or a private sector-driven development. So one of the key things we want to do is be very careful in how we bring in any concessional financing we bring to be able to drive private sector into the country, to lead the actual development. So for example, concessionality or blending, financing blending, from uh, our concessional resources, we are very careful in now uh, uh, making sure that it brings in private finance. And now we're also thinking of how to bring in the climate finance, as you mentioned, the concessional private finance, and leveraging as much as possible with private finance and not just typical sovereign financing. Uh, I think I'll leave it at that so that I don't say too long, and hopefully we can redo it. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. I'll hear, we'll hear from FAO from Julia Wolf, and then uh, Veronica will, uh, she's heard what uh, you've all said, and she'll give us the negotiator's perspective to this. So Julia, to you. Thank you very much. So my name is Julia Wolf, and I work for the Food and Agriculture Organization. I'm really pleased that FAO was invited to speak at this event, because what I heard from the earlier speakers is um, that there's a lot of need, and, that, and sorry, I will pick on your points, Johan, in terms of the need for convergent leveraging of finance and um, the delivery on, uh, of speed. So basically, uh, when the NDC partnership was born in 2017, we felt that there, there's a need. So a lot of countries, um, so FAO has a, a set of member countries, they approach us saying, well, wouldn't it be very interesting to have a separate thematic working group that looks at NDC implementation and the agriculture sectors? So when I talk, uh, mention agriculture sectors and food security, I'm actually speaking about the land sector, and that includes agriculture, um, forest, fisheries, and also the, the food systems. Here at COP, we hear a, lot, hear a lot about the food systems, so the whole uh, the value chain, right? So um, that's why we, we um, sat together with the NDC partnership and said, okay, that would be really helpful. And so we, we launched uh, the partnership in 2017. There were two consultative meetings ever since with um, partner countries um, defining what would be the scope of the thematic working group. And we have Australia and Uruguay as the, the country chairs to define the scope of work. So what we've been doing ever since is, um, for example, to work with countries that are part of the partnership in terms of case studies, so unpacking what it means, NDC implementation for the sector. And, and I think it's very encouraging. We hear here from, from other panel members saying, well, it's not just enough. I mean, of course, the key is finance and planning ministries. And I agree, we want to see them more at the COPs. But it's also to hear the voice of the sector and address the needs and gaps in terms of domestic finance that is already allocated. Um, and, and as you know, there's huge investment portfolios that need to be climate sensitized. And also to look at additional financing um, from international climate finance. So there's a lot of work to do and what, what is often needed. And uh, this working group tries to facilitate the exchange between countries because every country has a different institutional settings in particular when it comes to this, those different uh, subsectors. And what we need to hear from countries, how they've been going about really advancing and accelerating implementation. Um, so, so that's what this working group tries to, tries to do. I um, also want to flag at the first panel that we heard from uh, Mozambique and also Kenya um, on how they already have been going about um, implementation. Um, the other point I'd like to make is um, that, just to mention again a little bit what is happening here at COP, that uh, there was a very important and successful uh, first workshop to uh, consult on the Cornivia Joint Work Program on Agriculture, which is a joint agenda item under SAPSA and SPI. And uh, this, uh, this last Monday, we heard from the constituent bodies how they would reflect in their work, and that, that includes, for example, the Adaptation Committee, 
the uh, uh, CDC and the Standing Committee on Finance, how they actually address agricultural food security within the convention. But it's also a question how the different banks, the different agencies do follow up in terms of strengthening the importance of NDC implementation for agriculture food security, and that's both mitigation and adaptation, because agriculture has to be thought together. Um, mm -hmm. This is just some points I wanted to flag. I also have the honor actually to represent the colleague in the room who is leading mm -hmm. on the partnership, that's Martial Bernou, and uh, so he, he only could join later, that's why I was requested to make the, the presentation or the input. And Marcial, I just wanted to say, uh, if you would like to add uh, on some of the concrete activities that the working group is already delivering, and also on FAO. Yeah, please go ahead. So just, just to add on the spot, thank you, Julia. <laughs> so uh, concretely, FAO will uh, start to implement uh, this year a regional uh, small project. It's what we call TCP fund. It's technical cooperation project it, uh, for Africa. It's trying to, it, 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 it's, it's aim really to, with countries, trying to reach out uh, major uh, donors or fund, trying to enhance the ambition and NDC in the agriculture sector. So we will start with that small uh, fund this year. Uh, we will support two, three countries. And Mozambique is one of the countries we are forcing to, to support in, in that. And we are open to hear from other countries' their interest. And this project is in a collaboration with African Union. And concretely, also, we are engaged in the thematic working group to, to work on NDC regional analysis to understand in a regional dimension what are the gaps and opportunity with the agriculture sector to enhance the ambition. And we started this in 2017. The first one was on Eastern Africa. For that COP, we, we had one on uh, Central, no, East and South Europe and Central Asia. And in the future, we are planning to have, uh, but we are still looking for how to, 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 to do that with collaborators for Northern Africa and Western uh, Africa and Middle East also. So we have some concrete plan to have regional analysis to look at uh, gap and opportunity. That's it. And just to complement the first case study on the thematic working group was uh, with uh, Zimbabwe. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Sorry. Thank you. I also would like to flag that FAO is already part of the Africa NDC hub, yeah. and we are more, most interested also to collaborate with the Pacific hub um, in, in, in the other emerging hubs, because we think it's, it's really good to, to really um, provide countries with substantive technical support to understand needs and the way forward to accelerate uh, implementation and ambition. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. And so, uh, Veronica. What do you take from this? Can I? Oh. Hello. Um, thank you very much. Um, indeed, it has been an exciting uh, platform to hear countries how they are planning and implementing their indices. And I hope as the negotiators will not fail them in terms of giving them the sufficient guidance at a minimum that will direct um, the formulation of their indices in terms of increase, increasing ambition and the actual clarity and transparency to enable those that want to support the indices understand the information that is embedded within um, the particular indices. And I think there's been a discussion around differentiation in terms of how the guidance is going to factor in the whole differentiation discourse. And for us, what really matters is not about developed developing, but it's that um, realization that we've got different starting points, but there's need for a career growth ability type of approach. So we, we, we believe the guidance, um, for example, Kenya looked at uh, the elements around uh, gender and uh, a full Okay, thank you. Um, Is that right? Okay. Um, Kenya looked at an, uh, an example of adaptation in their indices. They also highlighted the whole element of gender. Um, we, we, we are also in a, in a bridge to say um, if we are going to be telling parties to look at stakeholder con uh, considerations, gender considerations, human rights considerations, are we not micromanaging 
the parties uh, in terms of how they should formulate their emphasis. But at the same time, those are the key uh, elements when you look at the actual sustainable development discourse to say how is it built in and how is it embedded. So that balance to draw the minimum, what is the minimum that the guidance should incorporate and what is the minimum guidance that we should bring into parties. So we have the whole issues around the features of the emphasis. Um, which we believe they're already embedded in the Paris Agreement in terms of that the, the indices is nationally determined. So you choose the type of indice that you want to use. And um, the common time frames, it's another feature of the indices, which is also being discussed, which will also allow for aggregation and ambition uh, among parties in terms of their indices. And then we have uh, information for clarity, transparency, and understanding. And we're saying for each particular indice, what is the that particular information that we need. If you have a quantifiable indice, what is that reference point or that base here that you'll be using? And how are you going to be uh, qualifying that? And then the actual accounting for your indices. But the other element I think which then uh, our partners here will come in broadly is the actual then implementation of indices before the accounting for indices. And we are saying what is that type of information that they need to, for them to be to enable you to then develop your indices into strategies and fundable programs and projects that you will then be able to account for and say indeed we achieved uh, our indices. So it is also that support which we require for the actual preparation of your indices and then the actual uh, support for the implementation of your indices. We are looking at the aspect around markets. You know, uh, We have some countries, uh, especially in Africa, the, the CDM didn't benefit most of the African countries. Now we are moving into the indices, and we are saying if our countries are going to be using markets in the indices, what is the, what is the structure like, and what type of capacity building and guidance do they need, and what is the role of our partners, the NDC hubs that are being formulated, our banks, the development banks, what are they going to be doing to assist the African uh, community to develop their indices and package them in a way that they'll benefit from the system that are being formulated. So we hope that uh, whichever part is going to be incorporating uh, Article 6 in their indices, they'll be assisted enough so that they benefit from the process and it's not just a document which is not implemented. So that is the whole discourse around uh, balancing the guidance and the actual implementation. And of course the whole discourse that has been highlighted in relation to blending and to hybrid financing and how we take it through from the ground um, from policy up to the community level implementation implementation as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very good, uh, Veronica, taking us through uh, what, uh, what is on the negotiation tree in terms of the work that we do in the regional NDCs. Thank you very much, uh, the panel. We'll do a, r a last round because I'm going to ask that, uh, unfortunately, you can turn around. This is what we got back as feedback from the Slido. From in the two words that come to mind when you hear NDC uh, hub, flexibility, complexity, integration, there's a whole range of 30. NDC support, a platform, coordination, solidarity, acting together, that is very important. Implementation now, the agency. Those are all things that kind of, and then sharing and leading. These are all words that mean the work for us. These are words that are enshrined in our work programs. And with that, I will ask the audience if there's any two questions. It's almost, it's lunch time, our lunch is waiting. Two questions, two burning questions, if anybody has anything to ask this panel and then we take it. I'm organizing an event like in 10 minutes, so I need to go. But Marcel will take my seat. All right, thank you. So we have the first question. Yeah. Uh, please pass the mic, the first, yes. Let's hear the first question. And thank you very much to all the panel members. I think even the previous um, panel as well, I think this has really shown that there is that political will. Um, there is also the collaborative efforts um, to get the NDCs moving. I think everybody touched on how it's important to get the private sector engaged. Um, even on the hubs banner, we see the two um, focus areas on adaptation and private sector engagement. But I think something that will be good, especially with us being in line with the theme for today's event, implementation, 
and maybe this question will go to the, the banks and the NDC partnership. What concrete um, steps are you taking to engage the private sector? We talked about the need to convert. We talked about the need to leverage. We need the private sector to be part of these discussions. Um, and again, when we say private sectors, even for developing projects, bankable projects, aligning it with sectors and technology. Um, and again, maybe to the hubs, do you envisage the private sector being part of the members of the hub as well? Thank you. Uh, you want to respond? Okay. Um, thank you for your question. It's very practical. <laughs> And uh, one of the things I could uh, give an example of is, uh, for ex we have a whole uh, PPP uh, division, uh, public-private partnership division, in the Islamic Development Bank. And we also have a whole private arm, which is called Islamic Cooperation for the Development uh, of the Private Sector, ICD. It's like the IFC in the World Bank Group. For now, though, for PPP, just last year, we've approved, we have, uh, in ways to develop private sector projects, we have a facility for project preparation where we actually prepare projects in our member countries that let's say are not bankable yet, but that would be suited to the private sector. So uh, we have, uh, it's not a large amount, I think it's $10 million every year, but this enables us to engage and develop the projects, hopefully very quickly due to the nature of the work of this PPP division, to directly engage with the private sector. And this PPP division's partners are mainly the private sector. Uh, another thing, one of the things, and then I, I invite you to come to our MDB pavilion on Wednesday at 2, uh, where we are working on a platform for private sector only with FMO, unfortunately the colleagues from, uh, from are not around, for, uh, with FMO and our PPP division and our energy division to develop um, actually bankable private sector projects in energy efficiency in one of our regions, in the many regions. So North Africa, for example, is covered on the, uh, the hub and we want to extend it also to West Africa. So this is a way we will make private financing first available with some concessionality in a very practical way. So we will ha we'll have to identify targets, target projects directly, implementable projects, ideally part of NDCs, country NDCs, within the next 12 months to eight, 12 to 18 months once the platform is uh, is active. So this is one way. Again, we're engaging directly, producing, uh, developing mechanisms that enable us to directly identify and implement projects. One more thing, we're also partnering with uh, the Regional Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, RICRI, and also with the one for West Africa, ICRI, for, to help us in the development of these projects, ideally for the private sector, uh, and uh, basically financing them through these mechanisms. We're starting with ICRI now, and we're hoping to move to West Africa after. So I hope this answers the question a little okay. bit on some practical examples. I'd like to give some examples too. Uh, so we've helped mobilize about a billion dollars in green and climate finance for our members in 2017 and 18. And a pretty significant share of that came directly from the private sector. Sure, we've helped some of our member countries get grants from the GCF uh, for Ethiopia, for Rwanda. Uh, but in other cases, for Senegal, for instance, we worked together with the government of Senegal and the African Development Bank to put together what's called a uh, Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Fund, which is, if you like, uh, this blended finance. And it came out of a workshop that we organized in Senegal to say, ask the private sector, so what's stopping you from investing in off-grid renewable energy? By the way, the first thing they said is government policies. But the second thing they said is finance. And indeed, moving money into banks so that it becomes available to small and medium enterprises so that they can get access to debt finance that at, at a reasonable rate of interest so that they can invest is a key way in which we can use the concessional finance more effectively. So that is a key way, blended finance, that we can do in a number of countries, either through government or, uh, if you like, banks like the African Development Bank, or to, through private banks. In Mongolia, we've set up such a structure where a ZAC bank, a private bank, has put in the proposal to the GCF. And in other cases, we don't even need concessional finance. The example I gave in Guyana, or another example in Thailand, where you can bring back, bring together industry and private investors directly for areas that are already commercially attractive. So those are sort of three different buckets. 
you know, sometimes we, we do need government support, uh, particularly for socially inclusive, uh, you know, uh, areas where you want to bring energy to poor communities who can't pay back. In other cases, we can at least leverage that uh, concessional finance by having the private sector contribute, or in the more commercially attractive areas, we should have the private sector invest directly. All those are, in fact, available. And the best NDCs will, I think, be a combination of those three sources. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, last question, Linus. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Linus Mofo from the African Climate Policy Center of the Economic Commission for Africa. And I, my question was actually linking to the point that Frank just made about uh, when you're mobilizing finance from the private sector, we know that the NDCs of uh, countries have got conditional and unconditional financing. So how should we best support countries? Are we going to just focus on targeting the conditional finance so as to ensure that they can then do the, uh, the unconditional finance? But then the issue then is that the private sector will come in for the easier components that can make profit for them. So. I just wanted to, uh, by the way, thank the panel for the input, but we'd like to hear, uh, hear your thoughts on how to best target the, the support and the mobilization of finance on these issues of conditional and unconditional financing of the NDCs. Thank you. Uh, John, do you want to take that? Um, how do you see the conditional, non-conditional breakdown of things? Yeah, so in some countries we are finding this uh, as a chicken and egg scenario. Which one would come first? Um, some countries could easily say, well, you have to fulfill your uh, conditional commitment before we fulfill our unconditional commitment. Every single macroeconomic anal analysis that we have done in, I would say, 80% of the countries where we are working, and we're working in 36 different countries, we see a huge disconnection between unconditional targets and the macroeconomic projection of the government even meeting the current ambition when it comes to unconditional target is going to be very difficult given the current macroeconomic situation. So obviously if things improve, then you have more fiscal space, you have more revenue, and you can invest. Um, so we are looking into that. But <clears throat> when it comes to the conditional commitment, what we are really trying to do is make sure that the grant money that the development partners are bringing can actually generate greater return than what they had been doing in the past. Yesterday, for example, Germany announced that they are going to be putting in 500 million US dollars to support, uh, sorry, euros, to support um, the NDC partnership member countries for project implementation. Now, that's great. Now, if you can bring more development partners into this, and as uh, Frank was saying, if you can leverage that financing to attract the private finance, then I think we have a good way forward. Uh, but even before we go there, I think there's a lot of work that we need to do in terms of the costing of indices and to what extent that costing is really realistic and feasible for the countries to, to move forward with the second generation of indices. Sorry, that's not a very specific answer to your question, <laughs> but we don't have a very specific answer as yet. All right, let's hear from If everyone. I may give the FAO perspective on that. It's sector specific, but I guess it's valid for all other sectors. First, there is no public money that will never be enough to support all adaptation and mitigation action. So we need private sector. But on finance, on big finance like uh, the HSBC or the climate bonds, so you have a lot of initiative. But the, the question is, who is setting the rule? And this is, for me, the most important. The FAO, we are thinking that we, who, is, who should set the rule? It's UN communities, countries, that, because if the private sector himself sets their own rules, it will not work properly. So we need to be engaged in setting the rule for sustainable development to ensure the private sector will select the good options. Okay, thank you very much, that is interesting. T Let's have the last speaker, TJ, Islamic Development Bank. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much um, for the wonderful session. Um, 
my name is Ola Tunje from the Islamic Development Bank, and I'm actually so excited that Jahan is here uh, because my question will probably be directed to him. Uh, uh, <laughs> And I've actually asked this question among the, uh, the last time we actually had MDB's meeting um, regarding NDC partnership. And it's around perception that countries do have that um, the financial partners that are involved in the NDC partnership, that all they are bringing is grants. Uh, in fact, you mentioned it a few minutes ago, saying the grants that the uh, uh, financial partners are bringing. Uh, I think it's, uh, how do we want to actually address this perception issue? For instance, for uh, development banks like ours, uh, it's not 100% grant. Yes, there are grant elements. So how do we address this in such a way that countries, because the expectation is that the moment you're saying you're going for country engagement, they believe that everything that is coming is grant, right? And we, we don't operate, like at least we have some grant element, but it's not as much as some other MDBs like the World Bank. So then how do we address this particular perception issue? And the other part is the 100 billion discussion under the Paris, uh, the negotiation that we've been having over the years. Then how do we try, is what we're doing as financial partners, is it part of the 100 billion discussion or is it separate from it? Because we need to try to let countries understand that I think the 100 billion discussion is something else and what we are doing is we are doing our development activities as that's our mandate as development banks, but we're also using, we're, we're like taking advantage of the core benefit that comes with our intervention. So I think it's very good that we try to let people understand that this is what it means when we're talking about development partners, or you try to distinguish between what a bilateral would bring to the table in terms of the financial instruments that they will be bringing, whether they're bringing grants, and what uh, a multilateral uh, uh, development uh, financial partner is gonna bring to the table. So if you could actually shed more light as to how the NDC partnership is trying to see ways in which you address this um, uh, perception issue. Thank you. Okay. Right. There is no doubt that there is expectation. Um, it's a startup. We are still trying to understand exactly where we can add value. But to answer your question very specifically, we are looking into three different buckets of financing. The first one that comes from the support unit, the secretariat itself, and our objective is to provide bridge funding. So for example, National Climate Change Action Plan of Kenyan government last December that they had requested for technical assistance to conduct mitigation uh, adaptation analysis, as well as coordination of the formulation of the National Climate Change Action Plan. Now, if you go to a bilateral or multilateral donor, by the time they complete the procurement process, it's gonna be June. And by June, they had to co complete the entire exercise. So we provided that funding quick technical assistance for a greater impact, and that is the National Climate Change Action Plan, and now you have an implementation matrix, now you have a coordination framework. So the investment that we made from, from grant actually had a bigger impact, so that's first. Not very strategic. The second one, I would say, is slightly more strategic. And what is that? What we are looking into is what could be the possible financing ag agreement between the bilateral donors and multilateral banks, for example, your shareholders. What could be the possible agreement between Netherlands and ISDB or Germany? I'm not talking about ISDB in particular, but multilateral banks in general. So we have to bring all these pairs together. So the current agreement that we have across various different entities is that Germany, Netherlands would provide financing to the implementing partners, including multilateral banks, provided they are putting money into the request for support letter that the countries are sending to the NDC partnership, plus the partnership plan that we are generating. So that's how we are trying to converge. Now, the agreement with World Bank is that, okay, I'm going to put $10 million of my grant, but you leverage from your own resources another 100 million. So that's exactly what we are trying to do. The ICI funding that I had mentioned coming from the German government, 500 million. The question is, how can we use this money to bring equity funding from ISDB, for example? So there are various different funding sources that we are looking into. Each has got its own model. Each has got different types of ideologies. Um, so we will continue to work on this and perhaps dispel the perception that you had mentioned that the the uh, partnership would only provide grant, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. You also have the option to provide equity, guarantee, other blended financing. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I think we have stretched ourselves. I think we've exhausted ourselves, and I think we are still very energized. Uh, I'm gonna ask my boss, 
Anthony Young to wrap it up for us, but let me tell you what I'm taking away. I'm taking away the 13 responses. These words create actions. These words are going to be our actions for the next uh, two, three years. All of us have plans up to 2030. This is going to be part of it. Thank you very much. One last announcement. We're going to do a group photo after he's wrapped it up. Please stay. Keep your smiles. I know you're hungry. <laughs> but there's, there's, uh, Thank you so very much, Davina. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, there are several other people that have benefited from the NDCs, I can tell you. A colleague of mine belongs to a political party in Ghana called NDC. And he says, since this creation of these NDCs, he's been so happy because everybody gets to know his political party. But having said that, thanks. Um, there are quite a lot of takeaways here. We had wanted to tell you a little bit about what the Africa NDC hub does because it seeks to address some of these issues we've talked about. We first started with, uh, we, have about, we have 15 partners with us, and we thought everyone is doing something on the NDCs. Where can we add value? So we had this gap analysis that looked at the development of the NDCs, the implementation of the NDCs, and we came up with those, uh, identified those gaps. Having identified the gaps, what, did we, where is the, having identified the gaps, we then developed a work program. Everybody jumps in, we are helping these implement NDCs. What are they? NDCs can only be implemented within the context of a national program, plan, strategy, and so on, that will identify the national budget, MDB funding, bilateral funding, all this cannot just be picked from trees. They have to be embedded in national development plans. And for us to get to that point, we realize that African countries basically need a pre-2020 preparation. So we just did a three-year work program that allows us to get to that point, such that by 2020, African countries will sit on the table comfortably. And this is our roadmap, lovely document, very not developed by us, but by the partnerships and consultations. But then we also looked at it that we have two clear focus areas. One is private sector. We've heard that here several times. How do you bring in the private sector to this? One, we are changing our narratives. $35 trillion investment opportunities in Africa by 2030. It's not a sunk cost. We're not going to see it as Africa needs help us. We have rooftop solar. We have all manner of things in the end. This is, this is where private sector operators come in and make money out of it. But when we continue the narrative we're having, climate change, gloom, doom, and so on, the private sector walks away. So we want to bring that private sector. And we've created what we call the African Financial Alliance on Climate Change, headed by the Minister of finance from the steering committee, finance of Rwanda, because they have leadership, and also Lord Nick Stern, because we want to bring global reach to it. So it's a serious uh, initiative. What this does is, is bringing together every player in the financial market in Africa. Re domestic resource mobilization, people don't want to talk about it, but we need it. We want to champion the fact that on the African continent, we have a lot of resources. Let's mobilize that resource and see how we can chart our development. It has nothing to do with NDCs. It is about Africa's development. Once we can look at it within that context, I think it adds more value to what we're doing. The second is the adaptation, which we've not yet published, that we've really looked at where have we missed it in terms of adaptation in the African NDCs. So I want to thank everyone for being here. We'll continue to work together. Um, to ensure that one narrative we also want to change is that Africa does not have the proprietary rights to being called the most vulnerable, the poorest. We want to change that. It doesn't belong to us. And we have the resources to change that. And if it's through this collaboration, we can put Africa on that trajectory to remain a low-emitting continent. We already are low. We want to maintain a low-emitting continent. And the other thing is, for the resilience, 
why must it always be that whenever there is rain, we eat? When there's no rain, we starve. That's the simple, most basic resilience. We can't even begin to imagine. So I'm hoping that through these coalitions, not just the African continent, the other developing countries in Pacific areas and the Caribbeans will come together and change the narrative of climate change. So thank you so very much for coming. Let's go ahead, implement the indices. Thank you so very much. And Before we go for lunch. There's a lot of food out there. We, we kept the best for the last. So the best food is, I'm Frank. <laughs>